So uh, my name is Elijah Meeks. I'm at uh, Stanford Libraries. I am not a quantum physicist. Um, what I do at Stanford in the library is I do uh, software development for something called the digital humanities, which is the use of computational methods to address traditional humanities research problems. So using uh, network analysis, spatial analysis, text analysis, natural language processing, or information visualization to look at things like uh, the social network of Voltaire or the travel in the Roman world. Uh, and one of the projects we just finished working on was something called Kindred Britain. And Kindred Britain is an interactive scholarly work. It looks at the relations between British cultural elites. So we have a network of 30,000 individuals, roughly 4,000 of which are mentioned in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. They're all related to each other. So there's 4,000 people and, who are important, and then there's 26,000 people who just get pulled along because they're only important because they connect the important people. And Kindred Britain is a public site at kindred.stanford.edu. It uses network visualization and uh, timelines and geospatial visualization and a lot of text processing. And it's all written in D3. I'm not going to get into too much detail about the other aspects of Kindred Britain. If you want, you can take a look. I did a postmortem on it in this sort of subsite to Kindred Britain, these notes from Kindred Britain. And there's also an essay from, uh, from the designer, who's Scott Murray. And there's an essay from uh, the PI on the project, Nicholas Jenkins in the English department. There's a lot of uh, sort of thoughts on building these kinds of uh, research projects for humanities research. So what I'm going to talk about is the network visualization component, which is a major component of Kindred Britain. And yes, sir? I just got a quick question. I yeah. was curious. Uh, can you go back to the previous slide? Sure. Right, so uh, um, Henry VIII is a, is a cultural elite. Um, Sigmund Freud is a British cultural elite, according to this definition, because he can be related to, these, to, to the people within this network. Um, Noel Coward, people who influenced British culture, according to. Well, celebrity isn't quite the right word for it. So we're talking about sort of a domain expert in the issue, somebody who studies British culture, who determines that these people are important for the advancement of society and culture in Britain. So whether or not a scientist, no, 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 a, a, an English professor. That's a domain expert, too. So whether or not these people are elites, that's, I mean, there's, there's this is what happens whenever you give a talk about uh, humanities topics. If you talk about quantum physics, nobody interrupts you to ask you whether or not <laughs> that particle really does that thing. But everybody has an opinion on whether or not somebody is an elite. And it's perfectly legitimate. I'm not trying to. It's, this, this is actually one of the interesting uh, components of this. Because you have 26,000 people who are not elites, but they appear within this network. And an interesting aspect of approaching uh, British culture from a network perspective is you find out that many of these non-elites from a network perspective, are far more central than people who are, who are prime ministers or famous authors. So the reason why we look at networks is because we're talking about families and family trees. Does anybody know what this is? So uh, 14th century BC in, uh, in Egypt, this is the Aten. It, uh, it was a radical cult worshiping the sun, but not Ra or Amun, but rather this Aten, the only god. It was a monotheistic cult promoted by this guy, Akhenaten. This is a family tree because Akhenaten is related to the Aten. He's the son of the Aten, and his wife, therefore, and his children are somehow related and tied to this. And it was an establishment of power. His son, Tutankhaten, you probably know as Tutankhamun, who after Akhenaten's heresy was, uh, was renamed Tutankhamun to show that he agreed with the, uh, the going Amun worship, I mean, the, the traditional Egyptian um, uh, theology, and distance himself from Akhenaten. It's a really interesting story. You can also see uh, this really insane way of how um, figures were represented during the Aten period, this, this sort of uh, uh, just fundamentally different from traditional Egyptian figural representation. There are other ways of representing networks, genealogical networks. We're familiar with them, these family trees, whether they're these sort of German um, dense things, or they're, they're more uh, religious. So this is Adam and all of the various ancestors of Adam and their importance. When we think of family trees, we think of network representation. It's an old 
and established form of network representation. So when we go and deal with 30,000 people who are all related to each other, each circle here, this is in Gephi, because it's 30,000 people. You don't deal with 30,000 people in D3, or 30,000 nodes. Well. You don't deal with it. <laughs> Maybe some people here do. I know that, yeah. I don't know. It keeps fuzzing at me. Maybe if I put it lower. And maybe now nothing will be recorded, so that's even better. <laughs> um, so representing 30,000 connected people, it's pretty straightforward. If we assume that the connections between people are these genealogical connections, oops. If we assume that it's genealogical connections, so if you had a kid represented here in blue, again, this is Gephi. If you got married, represented in green. Or if you had a sibling represented, in this case, in purple and you drop that into something like Gephi, then you get this wonderful and perfectly comprehensible representation of British cultural elites and their family relationships. Um, one of the difficulties is that this is not comprehensible. This is the problem with these hairball graphs that Piotr rep mentioned. And also that you can't provide a sort of interactive interface into it on the web. So one of the other reasons why we like force-directed algorithms is because there's lots of great examples of force-directed algorithms, especially in D3. And so you want to go and, and, and take some kind of network structure like this, and you want to put it out there so that people can play with it and examine it and explore it. But you might ask, well, why not represent it like a family tree, right? A traditional hierarchical layout. D3 has lots of methods for dealing with hierarchical nested data out of the box, tree maps, dendrograms, um, circle packing. So this dendrogram looks great. It's Erasmus Darwin and his mother and his kids and their kids and so on and so forth. Except that nested data, especially the data model that D3 uses, only allows for a single parent. So if you're dealing with issues where somebody like Erasmus Darwin gets married or has children with four different women, um, and you want to represent these relations, then, you're, then you go back to a more agnostic network data structure, which this force-directed algorithm deals with. But the problem with that traditional network structure, to get back to this, is that it's, not, it's much more abstract and less comprehensible to a wide variety of audiences. So what ends up happening, what I've found, oh, the joke is lost because of the clipping. Let me see if I can get out of this and, and, and make my joke more comprehensible. That's better. The punchline. Right. Um, so we run into criticisms of network representation. Ben Fry is the most uh, prominent of those, of, of those crit uh, criticisms that occurs in uh, visualizing data, where he talks about networks. Almost all data can be represented as a network, but almost no data should be represented as a network because it's incomprehensible. It's seductive primarily to the person who's been playing with that network in Gephi for six months. And when they present it, it wows an audience because it's abstract and, and interesting, but it doesn't actually pass on real fundamental information. And so you shouldn't use networks. And I think that fundamentally this is I mean, fundamentally it's correct in that adjacency matrices, hive plots, other ways of representing networks are often more comprehensible, especially when you're dealing with large networks. But just because you have problems like this with 30,000 nodes and lots of strange connections between them doesn't mean you can't address them in the browser using something like D3.js. So what kind of problems do we have? Well, we've got way too many nodes. You can't easily or, or feasibly show 30,000 nodes. Uh, each of these individuals has numerous categorical and numer numerical measures that indicate some, something interesting about them. Um, there are way too many links, so 30,000 individuals. And if you're linking siblings, then you end up with 80,000 links. There are too many different ways to represent it, and uh, too many relation classes. I'll get into that a little bit later. But to get into how we actually address this in Kindred Britain, what we've done, first of all, we took the, the basic limitation of D3, which is that you can get away with about 100 nodes in a browser. And we designed the website to present something around 100 nodes. Um, in a typical view. You have to, in certain cases, even when you limit what you represent, you have to build in governor functions into your, 
into your, uh, or I had to build in a governor function into the force directed layout because in Safari, for some reason, the performance was much worse. So actually in Safari, if you go to Kindred Britain, the Safari version of it seems to be um, slow and ragged. Uh, it looks the same as Firefox, but what's happening in Firefox is Firefox is actually just running it slower. In Safari, if you don't have this governor in where it only actually updates the node every tenth tick, then it'll just freeze when you load up the site. Don't know why. But there are methods that we can use to solve some of these problems. So we have too many links. Well, there's something called edge bundling, um, where links from similar nodes in similar regions of the network start to uh, uh, attract to each other as, they, as they're drawn across. And there's some interesting implementations of edge bundling in D3, some dynamic edge bundling, and some that's with hierarchical layouts. Uh, we have a default view for different types of representations, and I'll get into those types of representations. A basic aspect of using force directed layouts in D3 is you should always use G elements for your nodes. Many of the examples are based on circles, but G elements allow you to pack uh, various channels into your nodes. So you can have a background circle, and you can have a foreground opacity filter on it or something. You can have a label on top of that and, and an image if you want, if you have some kind of icon for the node. Different channels for categorical and numerical and topological attributes, and I mean channels in the sense of sort of information visualization channels. So use size and icons and position and color for different categories of information and stick to that. Uh, and then take advantage of the various uh, uh, modifiers to how the layout is actually, is actually drawn dynamically. Now we don't do much of this in Kindred Britain, but I have a few examples. So one, thing that I, one of these things that I built was uh, this network layout toy in D3 that allows you to sort of see how changing the charge value for, uh, for nodes affects the way that the, the actual network is laid out such that there are different values, and they can be dynamic values tied to attributes, or they could be fixed values, are better suited for different types of network layouts. So taking advantage of, of most of the, of the functions for laying out in the, in, in the out of the box force layout can take functions that can change the repulsive quality or the attractive quality of links or nodes based on attributes of those nodes and tying that typically to attributes, not just the sort of static attributes of a node, but its topological attributes. So whether or not it's a densely connected node or, or not can help you to avoid these problems where you have these hairballs. There are also other methods of grouping um, typically, or in what I've used is convex hulls and, and Voronoi diagrams, where you can show regions in networks. So there was a great example of a Voronoi diagram tied to a, dynamically tied to a network layout underneath. So this is a force directed network underneath. Each of these circles here is connected to all of the circles that it's nearby. It has a Voronoi diagram drawn on top of it. And you'll notice that each of these regions is a different size. And that's because the strength of the links, which aren't visible, is based on a fixed area attribute of the various neighborhoods that are being represented here, such that you can have different areas in your Voronoi diagram based entirely on the interplay of a, of a neighborhood that's small, exerting not much repulsive quality, and a neighborhood that's large, pushing that neighborhood away. So you can present regions. This is on a. This is on one of my uh, gists on GitHub. Um, you can present regions. You can rely on convex hulls, which, we, which, which I'll get into when, I, when we look more at Kindred Britain. And you can sort of remember that while you're, while you're dealing with network layouts, even if underneath the data model and your primary structure is a force-directed network layout, that you can shift away from it to more traditional ways of representing things, more fixed ways, more parametric ways of representing the network data underneath. The other thing is take advantage of interactivity and try to understand what interaction with a network layout means from a UI UX perspective. So when somebody clicks on a node, what are they doing? They're focusing their attention on that node. One of the general rules that I've found very useful is that when somebody clicks on a node, when somehow a node is active, stop the network. Right? Somebody's clicking on it and the network's flying around, just stop it. Use force stop and, and just stop the network so they can see where it is. And also, anchor that node so that when 
the network starts moving again, that node is fixed into position because you can allow the user then to sort of drag net nodes out of hairball regions and maybe understand and explore the data better. Highlight topological characteristics, so show the, the labels of the ego network like we saw with Piotr's example, or show the links that come into a node. Indicate where a node is different, and this requires some, some general understanding of network analysis principles. You can base that off of, off of static attributes, but really what you want to do is you want to understand from a network perspective, why is this part of the network different from that part of the network? You can use collision detection, so when people are dragging their node around, and they're taking it over other nodes, that's an opportunity to afford them an interaction technique, uh, remind them of what's usual and unusual, not only about the node, but about the structure that they're looking at, the larger structure. Remember that it's not just nodes and links, it's these communities and clusters that are within the actual network. And give the user the capacity to adjust the layout. If you just provide, for instance, the ability to, to sort of sort I mean, to, to adjust the charge and adjust the force, then you give the user the capacity to maybe better understand the network from whatever perspective they're bringing into it that you didn't imagine that, they, that, that was, was an interesting topic. And then after that, um, so Kindred Britain runs on a Postgres database. And so we don't do all of the pathfinding techniques on the fly in D3. We do it at the, at, on the back end, and then we provide, or the ego networks that Kindred Britain provides some kind of sample of the network. We use PG routing for the pathfinding and just basic Postgres functions. You might be familiar with a Neo4j database, which allows more interesting pathfinding functions. Um, measure your graph. There's lots of network measurements, and there are, there are different suitable network measurements for different types of networks. Um, Start to write pathfinding problems in JavaScript. I mean, it's really, so a simple implementation of Dijkstra and a simple implementation of a breadth first search is in that little toy. And it's used to do really interesting things, even though it's extremely primitive and not very, um, not very fast. But fortunately, I'm only dealing with 50 nodes here or 75 nodes here. But it allows me, because I have some pathfinding functions in here that you could run, it allows me to highlight certain things that are visible only when you run pathfinding functions. So this is what I refer to as the spatial problem. When you're representing a network, the problem with a hairball is that your reader looks at a network and assumes that things that are next to each other are similar. It's the first principle of geography. Things that are near each other are similar. And if they're not, there's something interesting there. Well, with a network, things that are near each other might be very far apart as far as network distance goes. So these blue nodes here are less than 60 pixels apart but they're, but they're actually three steps or more from each other from a network perspective. You can only do that if you can actually run on the fly sort of simple network pathfinding functions like Dijkstra or Breadth First Search. And what this allows you to do is it allows you to at least to educate your reader as to problems in your network. So if you adjust it, you're going to fix that problem and you're going to create another problem somewhere else. Now you can also tie this to dynamic functions that update the network. We don't use much of this functionality in Gephi, I mean in Kindred Britain because it doesn't really run into these kinds of problems. You have more constrained, more curated network data sets. And then finally, um, we're used to reading and exploration with networks. We really need to create interesting ways to create new structures within the network, whether that's new nodes or new links or simply modifying things, uh, selecting parts of the network so that content creation becomes a part of these, of these force-directed layouts. The end result is that something like Erasmus Darwin's family, which is all of these. So here's Erasmus. There's the four women that he had children with. All of his children, all of their grandchildren, so Charles Darwin's in there somewhere, Robert Darwin's in there somewhere. His parents, their grandparents, can be laid out in multiple ways. So it can be laid out in sort of a traditional hierarchical family tree. It could be laid out in a force-directed algorithm. It could be laid out as a path. Or it could be plotted. And don't forget about the sort of value of simple things like plotting, in this case, birth date by death date. So you can see when there are periods in this family when people are dying young. I mean, it's a very simple data point, but it's visible. 
And in other families, um, some of these more tragic families, like Virginia Woolf, you can really see um, some of the reasons why they wrote very sad things. Uh, so let's take a look at this actually in Kindred Britain. One of the other points, oh boy, this will be fun. Small screen. Uh, one of the other points is that oftentimes it's OK to have a network representation that it doesn't do much of a network. Almost nothing here is connected. They're just nodes floating in space. So these are, this is the home screen on Kindred Britain. It's 100 notables, 100 luminaries, um, like Robert Malthus, uh, who originated the concept of the Malthusian collapse when there's too many people and not enough land for food. And uh, Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington, who defeated Napoleon, T.S. Eliot. So we can go and drag T.S. Eliot around. Again, after I've stopped dragging T.S. Eliot, he's anchored. Now we can free him up. But uh, you can drag him, and you can take him near somebody and see some kind of comparison. Or you can drag him even closer, and you can find out the link to how T.S. Eliot was related to Robert Malthus. So T.S. Eliot's father's mother's mother's sister's son's husband's blah 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 was uh, Robert Malthus. And this is one of, those, one of those issues that we're running into. Well, it's, it's reasonably awesome. But one of the challenges which you run into with all of this seductive network visualization is this problem, right? Is anybody at all familiar with Spaceballs? I was totally thinking that when right. you chose the last one. So the final scene of Spaceballs, right? You're my mother's cousin, sister's roommate's, ex-wife's, whatever. And what does that make us? Absolutely nothing. So yeah, that's a great pattern, but what is it? And so explaining that pattern is more important than simply representing it. Representing it, as difficult as that might be in all of these different ways, um, is sort of secondary to actually helping people to understand it. So let me adjust to the screen size again. So we've got this path eventually. But because underneath this is a force-directed algorithm, then we can sit here and say, well, plot it as a force-directed algorithm instead. And so it can float in space, because maybe somebody finds that more useful to see it floating in space. Or maybe they want to go and anchor T.S. Eliot over here, and they know this person, they want to put this person over here, and they know this person, they want to put this person over here, because that's somehow meaningful to them. The other thing that this allows for is uh, the use of convex hulls to indicate another pattern. So we know that these people are somehow related to each other. We also know that they're related to each other in another respect. So we use convex hulls underneath to show shared activity spheres. Now how this is working under the hood is that there's a, an invisible node that represents arts and humanities. It has a bunch of invisible links that connect all of these people who share arts and humanities as, a, as an activity sphere. And then we use the D3 built-in convex hull drawing to dynamically draw it. And we use a SVG bounding box to drop the title, the label, in the center. So then you can look at, this is a little more impressive when we look again at something that doesn't have any, uh, doesn't have any seeming connections. And we drop professions on them so we can see who these people are and how different activity spheres might, might interrelate to each other. So military officers who are also in politics and in the monarchy tie together the civil service and the monarchy. And you have these, these potential stories, these potential explanations that you can reveal using that kind of technique. You might also want to lay it out again. So plot it. Again, it's a plot. It's just using nodes in a scatter plot. It's not really complex. And this one's not particularly informative because it's over the course of 600 years, so it gets even out. But these kinds of things, hierarchical layouts, simple hierarchical layouts that just go generationally or plotting, um, allow you to explain more with your network than you might explain uh, using that force-directed algorithm that's subject to the problem of hairballs and things like that. So there's more. It does other things. It's got a timeline somewhere in there and some text and stuff. That's about it. Any questions? Yes, sir. Did you find anything out that, that you didn't know before, or uh, the generic you? I mean, because it looks like you could see connections that might not otherwise be obvious. Right. Well, 
So that sort of focused perspective on a, on a single family unit that's only two generations back and two generations forward can sometimes reveal things like, uh, like uh, Mary Shelley and Percy Shelley. If you look at Mary Shelley's family and you, for instance, plot them, you see all of these children dying young. And, it's, and then Shelley goes off and writes Frankenstein. And Frankenstein's this novel about, um, a, you know, somebody's, so this doctor creates a monster. It's his child. It's about death, and it's about pain, and it's about negative things. So there's simple stuff like that. And then there's the sort of larger, um, there's some larger network, uh, there's some larger network patterns. So this is another, this is, this is my argument against Ben Fry. So here's 30,000 nodes in a force directed layout that actually says something. So you can see actually class divisions looking at how um, people who are similar to each other using traditional network similarity measures, they organize differently. This is actually not the family network. This is a different network based on similarity matching between shared professions and shared um, measurements of each individual. And so you have these definite three or four different streams that relate, um, roughly speaking, to different classes and castes. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, my, my perspective on this is more of an information science perspective and sort of building this thing and trying to present complex data like that. So I think that that's something I didn't know before, the representation aspect of it, the interactive aspect of it. As far as the actual subject matter, you're better off talking to the guy who has a PhD in English. Yes, sir. So getting back to that, the multiple parents issue, um, it, you know, in, in dealing with some of the some of the kinds of data that you're looking at, I imagine there's some uncertainty around parentage, right. among, among other things. And I was just wondering if you know, there was any scope in, in how you approach this or anything you'd learn along the way to represent that, um, to show that, or how, how that story might be told. So I just want to get old Erasmus and his, and his extremely tragic life of children. Um, representation of uncertainty and representation of, uh, of the inaccuracy that underlies historical data, the evidentiary gaps, is dealt with a bit in here, but it's dealt with primarily in the text. It's dealt with primarily in how you explain how we derive some dates. So a lot of people in here didn't have birth dates and death dates. They, so we had to derive those from relations and sort of typical birth dates and death dates from that period. and we give some indication as to whether or not dates are estimated, or whether or not they're rough, or whether or not they're accurate. Uh, it doesn't deal very much with, historic, with, with that sort of historical uncertainty, though. Yes, sir. Um, well, I'm wondering if, as you were, uh, you were analyzing the data, you found certain questions that you wanted to answer with visualization, and you decided to, say, implement the complex solving as right. a way to, to capture the sort of grouping. Right, so there's, uh, there's the two sides to it. One of them is the sort of exploratory data analysis, where you're looking at it and you realize, hey, convex hulls allow us to show this network perspective from a slightly different view. Um, the other side of it, which is sort of uh, hypothesis-driven uh, representation, isn't dealt with so much in the information visualization aspect of it. It's dealt with more, there's, a, there's a, an interactive story aspect of this that, atri that attempts to integrate the structures shown here in information visualization into the traditional narratives that are, that are uh, presented about the individuals in here. Um, to a certain degree, the, the, there, there is this issue of representation of how people are related to each other and making that readable. Um, we went through several iterations on how to show the path from one individual to another. And some of them use really cool packing methods that, that, that use the space most efficiently. And it turned out that the best way was just to walk over in the way that you see in, in very uh, uh, simple genealogical packages that do that out of the box with PHP and, and, and MySQL. Um, from my perspective, more of that came with dealing with the data from a larger perspective. The, this, what we found was that it was more amenable to narratives and narrative explanations rather than sort of uh, large-scale statistical analysis or representation. There's some stuff that goes on here. One thing I think that we got out of this was this idea of a tragedy index. Um, that was one thing that sort of came out. So you can actually color people by tragedy. Um, 
more tragic people had children who died young, parents who died while they were young, um, other things that happened to their relations or happened to them. And this idea of, uh, of computationally addressing tragedy, computationally addressing centrality, and presenting centrality, for instance, in contrast to some concept of notability, um, was one of these, one of these uh, affordances we got out of representing it as a network. Yeah, uh, this is more of a general question, uh, more from UX point of view. So when I see a lot of these data visualizations, first of all, I'm kind of new to it, I really like it. But after like a few minutes, I just kind of like get confused. Either it's too much going on, and I can't make sense of it, then I just like you know right. close the website. So uh, how would you suggest like making these th things simple? Because sometimes it takes too much time to just understand what is going on, right? Because it, it can become really interactive, engaging, but right. confusing at the same right. time. Right. I mean, there's we we have analytics tied to all of the buttons on here, and you can. <clears throat> see users, not use, all sorts of cool functionality that we spent a lot of time working on, or just sort of, I give up. Uh, the, only, the only example I can give out of this, other, I mean, first of all, this is a constraint, trying to deal with just this part of the network, rather than having it be something you could just navigate, and it would, you click on something, it opens up their relations, and so on. Um, the only thing that I, can, that I can offer is this idea of providing you know, leveraging text to provide some kind of better explanation of it. Okay. So that you're looking at something, and in the text, you're, you're using the same functions that are in the information visualization, but instead what you're doing is you're, you're telling the user some things, and you're tying this to functions that are available during exploration. So you're providing them with a sort of tutorial that, that gets them oriented toward what kind of information is being presented here. Right, well, I mean, text is a really great way of visualizing information. So we shouldn't just stop using it just because we've got all these cool circles. <laughs> <laughs> and what about, like, because a designer, like, how do you, how does the process work? Like, do you have a, like, a dedicated designer? Because sometimes designers can't even, you know, come up with these because these are done through D, uh, D right. just dynamically. So, like, they are just, you know, their Photoshop right. is not going to do this. You have to kick those designers to the curb. You have to work with designers like Scott Murray, who actually understand interactive information visualization. I was fortunate. Scott Murray wrote the book on interactive information visualization on the web. So our designer uh, understood what you could present and, and what was going on there. Uh, that said, um, I was, you know, you don't have to fire all the designers who don't understand information visualization. But uh, there are fundamental principles that, that harken back to sort of more simplistic I shouldn't say simplistic, but more sort of pure forms of visualization. For instance, representing a family tree like a family tree, um, which is something that's actually kind of tough to do with, at least for me, with that, uh, the network model that's underneath this. And that comes not from somebody who is the, the leading theorist on information visualization, but it comes from this sort of traditionalist perspective. So honoring that perspective too. Recognizing that information visualization of genealogies has been around for 3,500 years. And so you can, you can find good examples of that even if you're not familiar with this particular library. Um, what aspects of the visualization do you feel play to better teach people how to use the, um, the entire application? You mean within the stories? Well, so we teach people how to use the product by teach people how to use the product. This is great. I work in the, in the <laughs> university. My stuff doesn't have to sell. Um, it doesn't work on Internet Explorer 10. Who cares? Um, so one of the things that we've got is we've got simple sort of call outs at the beginning where we explain some of these basic principles of what's going on here. We open up the view and, and we set it to something that we consider to be at least as, as approachable as possible. Um, and then you provide different avenues into the, into, the, uh, into the information. So it might be that somebody is much more accustomed to dealing with a map. Lots of people are much more familiar with a map or a timeline. So you give them that capacity to just look at this, just look at the geospatial aspect of it, just look at the temporal aspect of it. Get away from because the network is stupid. They think the network is stupid. So you provide them with different views into the data. It's the same data. It's the, it's the same data set underneath, but it's just being processed in different ways because D3 lets you do that. 
So one more question. So when you were showing those like fancy charts and graphs, yeah, I'm curious like if somebody's new to uh, data visualization at D3, mm -hmm. how much of like mathematics background, like understanding the networks, how networks work, like the graph yeah. theory, how much of that do I need to know? Right. Because you know I can't like go and learn out of like. Cause it's Get a PhD in network science. Come on, man. No, I mean the cool thing about networks, and I'm I'm a firm believer that networks are as fundamental a way of representing information as maps. The cool thing about networks is that almost all of the descriptive network statistics are really simple. A lot of it's just counting. Once you understand how pathfinding works, you find out that so many of these measurements are just running pathfinding a lot and totaling up how many paths cross over things or come into contact with things. Clustering coefficient is really straightforward. Um, uh, page rank's actually pretty straightforward. Uh, these network statistics aren't the most complex thing. So I think that you do have to know that. I think that it makes for better use of networks as a way of conveying information. But it's n not going to require you to even get a bachelor's in it. But it will require some effort on it. Coursera course. Maybe, maybe, maybe not Coursera. Maybe two Coursera courses. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, uh, there was a slide by Raymond about the number of nodes that we can render in uh, this I don't know if you want to uh, get some techniques or someone else about sending a lot of nodes in uh, this week. Right. Um, I mean, the functional limit that I found across browsers was around 100, and that was dealing with a few more. Um, there's also sort of a, a visualization limit that once you, once you get to, to more than 100, it's hard to use screen real estate properly. Um, so ways to present more. I know a few techniques to, to leverage what D3 allows you to do um, and, and make it work in a browser. but. Uh, but the question is whether or not you want to. I mean, really, I think that's a design question of whether or not, let's say I can get a 350 node network working. Um, it's it's going to be difficult to use that properly without also bringing in uh, methods that, that deal with community detection and bring their own sort of, of computational requirements. I still think it's, it's worthwhile. And uh, using. D3 to represent more and more complex networks, I think, is, is, is worth, is time well spent. But it, it's, it's, it's progressively more difficult to represent it on screen, not just because of how slow it renders, but because of the complexity of the information. I mean, this is, as Piotr uh, mentioned, it's, it's multidimensional information. And the more of it you put up there, it doesn't just scale geometrically. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, this seems to be like a, a, a genealogical database that you've started hang, hanging other kinds of information on, like geography and and uh, profession and uh, things like that. Right. And I'm just curious uh, if you have any larger scale goals, like you know, philosophy, you know, history of ideas, and, and things like that. You know, this you know this architect worked with this architect. Right when he visited Rome and then he came back over to England and he did whatever, you know. And you could imagine people adding annotations and graph relations right. to your information base that would make it richer. Right. Not with this. This is, this is very much um, a, an authored work that has accomplished what the author wanted it to accomplish, what the authors wanted it to accomplish. However, we're working on a couple of projects right now. One of them is uh, is an archaeological project that's much more tied into linked data, open linked data, and deals with uh, just that subject of sort of not just um, graphs with many attributes, but also annotating those graphs and annotating regions within those graphs and meaning making using um, all sorts of different data types. And that's, I think, that in archaeology, you see, it, at least in, in social sciences and humanities, archaeology is sort of the leading edge of uh, the adoption of linked data standards. Do you, do you want me to? Okay. Yes, sir. Um, can you just you know, briefly mention some of the tools you use, particularly um, when analyzing uh, uh, large data sets? Gephi. Um, and Gephi, G E P H I, I think it's actually pronounced Jiffy because uh, it's French, um, which I find really useful. There's also Payek and uh, the other one. Um, also, uh, once you start to, once you use PG routing, in Postgres, you can use a lot of very interesting sort of network queries. It'd probably be more efficient and better suited if I'd done it in Neo4j, but I don't know Neo4j.
but Gephi is a good place to start. And there's a lot of decent tutorials, and it's not as incomprehensible as it used to be. Yes, sir. Beyond node limitation, is there what are the advantages and disadvantages of using D3 versus Gephi versus other things, that, other visualization software that you're experiencing? So Gephi allow you to export into Sigma JS, which is interactive. It allow you to export, as Piotr was mentioning, into a C Dragon output. Um, which is not interactive. It's just basically a slippy map of your network. Uh, the Sigma JS network is interactive, but it's not dynamic. So Gephi allows you to deal with a small, a relatively small number of nodes interactively with rich interactivity. These other methods are, are going to be much more sort of static and, and read-only. The thing I think that's the value of D3JS when it comes to network uh, representation is that everything that I learn how to do with the force-directed layout applies to when I'm using all sorts of other layouts in D3. So as I learn something in the D3 Geo area, I can actually apply that to the D3 Force area, and I can apply that to more custom layouts. So I think that there's a sort of investment, return on investment that you get from, from something that handles so many different information types, um, as opposed to sort of, you know, Sigma JS for my network, and Google Maps for my map, and Simile for my timeline. Uh, but from a, an analytical perspective, it's that D3 is going to force you into a, a very small view onto your network. Thank you.